Yeah, so cheers everyone for coming to this talk. Um, so it's, like I said, it talks about saving user data uh, one company at a time. And it's one company at a time because it's based on the companies that give me permission to hack them, basically. Um, but every company that does allow me to hack them via bug bounty programs, I'm finding your user data a lot of times, basically. Um, so for those of you who know me online, follow me. Um, my name is Ian Shawner, and I only hack with Burp Suites. So that's why I've put that on there as well. Um, I don't really focus on the recon and things like that. I tend to come to that later, um, which is, yeah, I'm basically going to teach you kind of how I hack and why I hack this way. Um, so very briefly, really quickly, I guess, um, who am I? So my name's Sean, um, and I go by the name Z Shawno online, um, for those of you who follow me on that. Um, I'm a web application security researcher hacker, um, so that basically means companies with big websites um, pay me to find vulnerabilities in them, usually via bug bounty programs. Um, I've done a bit of mentoring over the last year. Um, I've got a few YouTube videos out teaching people how to hack and how to approach hacking and getting involved in hacking. And I used to run a website called bugbaitingnotes.com. Um, I'm actually wearing one of the 30 hoodies that I had printed for it. Um, and for those, for those of you who I'm talking, who do follow me, the reason why I shut down Bug Bounty Notes um, is because it was kind of time constraint for me because I do bug bounties full time for a living. I don't have a job. I don't have any grades, qualifications, certificates, nothing. Um, so I rely on bug bounties to earn me money um, and kind of Bug Bounty Notes was taking up too much of my time and it wasn't earning me anything. So... But with that said, the good news is I have taken a step back and worked on something that won't be as time constraining for me and will still be able to teach you all how to hack like me. Um, so that will be out soon along with my methodology. Um, and I've added on there that I'm a Lucio run one trick because I play Overwatch a lot and I play nothing but Lucio. I've got like 600 hours logged and I like to use the memes of his face in all of my slides. So if you're wondering who he is, that's who he is, okay? Um, so yeah, and yeah, just a random screenshot of me on Bug Crowd because um, I feel like one of my great achievements is when I first got involved in bug bounty programs is I picked one program on Bug Crowd and focused nothing but on their program and I ended up with like 450 vulnerabilities and I went from no bugs all the way to number two um, and yeah, now falling down to number 11, but yeah. Um, so yeah, that's me over and done with. So. Now we'll get into the fun stuff, the hacking. So this is my approach to hacking. So everyone, and this is what I really emphasize in my methodology, everyone has got their own approach to hacking. A lot of people go for recon, they want to find subdomains that are coming live for a certain period of time. But my approach is I just want to focus on the main web applications. So that means apps that you've all got on your phone, websites that you're using at home every day. These are main web application websites and that thousands of people are using. Um, I come to the subdomains and what's exposed on the internet later because in my mindset, and I used to be a bit of a developer um, before I was hacking, but a main web application, if you can find basic bugs that should be preventable and shouldn't actually be there, then when you go to find the subdomains and everything that else is exposed, you've already got a kind of general mindset as to what the security is going to be like for this company and what easy things are probably going to be exposed out there and what can you find. Um, so, by targeting a main web application, like I said, I'm ignoring subdomains for now, I'm simply using the website as intended. So the same way all of you will log into, let's say, eBay, and you'll bid for something, you'll buy something, you might want to then return it. I simply just use a website as intended and just look at to how, what, how's it working? What request is sent? What IDs? What is actually, how's it working? Um, the bigger the company, the better, and the reason for this is because, obviously for me, for bug bounties, I rely on it for money, so I want as many mistakes as possible, but the bigger the company, the more teams, teams they might have abroad for different code bases and things, and that's going to mean more mistakes. So, say for example, you've got, I'll use TripAdvisor for an example, the website that I was hacking on Bug Crowd, they have their headquarters in America, so they have TripAdvisor.com, but TripAdvisor.cn is a completely different code base with completely different features and it's just completely new. So from something as simple as changing your um, user agent and what country you're from, you can go on mobile sites, um, view different um, locations and things like that and then it just brings more features, more bugs. Everyone following this is pretty straightforward in my opinion, my methodology I guess. Oops, I'm going backwards. 
Um, and also for that, again, is one mistake in production will always lead to many, many more. So you find one XSS, chances are you're going to find probably another 10. You find one idol, probably you're going to find a lot more. And it, the, do you know what I mean? You'll get a general tone for how this company's security actually is. Um, and this is why I always emphasize to people that if you want to be successful in bug bounty programs, you should stick to the same program rather than hopping from program to program to program. Because when companies fix the bugs, Look at how they've actually fixed it. So I've had some companies where there was an idle bug where I could leak anyone's data from just visiting api.example and change the number. And they fixed it. To view that user's ID, you had to have a unique hash, which only the user um, was, was obtained when they logged in. Pretty straightforward. I thought, okay, that's a nice fix. However, if you change it from a get request to a post request, it would say, oh, there's an error, and it would spit out that user's hash, unique hash code. So then I'd simply grab the hash code, change it back to a get request, add token, and I've got their user details again. So from seeing that, then when they patch the next bugs, so I instantly know, well, how are these developers thinking? And another way, and I don't kind of recommend you do it as such, but the more you target the same programs... If you've got one endpoint with, let's say, three XSS vulnerabilities on it, if you sometimes only just report two and leave one, you can get the sense of the company, well, did they proactively go and look further into the source code and see if there's anything else vulnerable, or did they simply just patch what you told them? 99% of the time, they'll only patch what you tell them. So again, you can take advantage of that, I guess. Um, and I've written on there, JavaScript files are your friends, because um, if you see my... I've got. A, a couple of hour video on YouTube for basically analyzing JavaScript files and that. And a lot of people always tweet me saying, this is a genius. Like, you're a genius, Sean. But targeting a main web application, of course I'm going to look at JavaScript files because that's how the website's been put together. Do you know what I mean? They use CSS files, they use JavaScript files. This is how it's actually put together. So sometimes when you're viewing the source of a HTML file, there won't be much interesting in there apart from some parameter names and things like that but when you start looking in the javascript files you can see old code which has been commented out which goes to old api codes you've sometimes got dev comments saying this is just a hacky fix we'll work on something later and things like that sometimes even leave their passwords in there why i don't know so that is basically my approach to hacking dumbed down as much as i possibly can is everyone pretty much understand the flow really so now I'm going to give you some examples as to basically apply my methodology um, and hopefully not scare some of you because some of you are students and one of my examples might scare you. Um, so first of all, this is leaking passenger flight information. I did do a blog post on this. Now, for those of you who have been on holiday, you understand when you check in, they want your booking reference and the last name that you use to make the booking, right? And it's pretty simple. Now, first of all, booking references can be easily guessed. They're usually only six characters long. They're only fucking letters. And sometimes there's numbers in it, but not often, depending on what airline, etc. Now, again, so applying my methodology to use this, it's a website where I can book a flight and check in, etc. So to obviously use it as intended, I need to book a flight and check in, basically, and see how this is working. Because not only when I check in, but I get extra to, I get access to extra features. So I can select a seat, I can add an in-flight meal. The more features I can get access to, the better. Because then I can get a general idea as to how this company basically is handling security. Because one thing I uh, always mention is I always go in with the mindset that they're secure. Because this is a main web application that thousands of people are using. So it shouldn't be vulnerable. So I'm going in with the mindset this is actually secure, basically. Um, Another reason why, obviously, you should, in my opinion, buy things on bug bounty programs especially is because not many people will spend money on bug bounty programs. They'll only ever go after the free um, features, whereas if you buy a certain feature to upgrade your account and things, you can then suddenly start testing, well, can the free um, account actually access the API calls that the paid account can access and things like that? And chances are yes. And like I say, two extremely key features should be secure. Now... <laughs> I don't recommend you try this on airlines which haven't given you permission to, but a lot more airlines are vulnerable to this, and yeah, I'll leave you to go with that. So what could possibly go wrong? Anyone have any ideas what could actually possibly go wrong? I mean, anyone think that airlines are pretty secure, right? They should be secure, shouldn't they? They've got your passport details, things like that. So... This isn't the actual website I was hacking. I can't mention names and things like that. Um, so yeah, but pretty simple. You've got to enter your ticket number and your last name. Everyone's done it. 
So yeah, by default, that's required. However, when I use my valid reference, so I input my um, ticket number and I put my last name, there was a request sent, obviously, to load up my um, booking information. However, in the background, there was a, re a request sent with just my booking reference, which responded with a JSON format of just my flight information. So it had, like, my name and things like that, the email used to book. And I was a bit like, why? Like, why is this request being made? Like, this probably shouldn't be happening. And I thought, maybe this is intended because I hadn't actually made an account at this time. I'd simply booked the flight and then went to check in because why not? Um, yeah, that's a good idea, Lucio. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next task. So, before I did this, um, and I did have a slide with uh, the request and information, but I didn't want to accidentally leak some information and people find out what company it was. But when I found this request, I then searched for the airline company and searched for any promotions they post. Because a lot of airline companies will post promotions and they'll add an example booking reference number on there. So I was like, I wonder what this testing booking reference does and whether I can actually query it. So when I queried it, it came back with all test at whatever it was. And I was like, well, hold up a second here. This is probably not good. So, yeah, basically there was one vulnerability to leak anyone's information just on a booking reference. Right in front of people, live production website, I couldn't believe it in my opinion. So my next task with attacking main web applications is I want to find as many features and endpoints as possible which handle a booking reference. Even if the last name is in the request, they might not actually validate it, it might lead to another bug. Because not only that, is because I've obviously found a fairly serious problem, chances are I'm going to make it rain bounties and I'm going to be a very happy man. So I don't really know why I put how, I guess, because it's pretty self-explanatory. But so just this is where I feel like, first of all, how many people here do bug bounties or have dabbled in bug bounties? A few of you. So a lot of people I find will read a blog post and then go and try that, which is fair enough. But in my opinion, again, to be successful in bug bounties is you kind of have to create your own little path while collecting what everyone else has been sharing um, because it's about what works for you. And like I said, I don't like going after recon and what's out there. I want to attack the main website. So at this point, I've checked in. I've got one bug and I'm now adding an in-flight meal. I am now checking in, changing my seats. I'm, I'm doing everything possible I can, clicking everything possible, changing user agent because maybe mobile app has got something different to the desktop app. Chances are it has because companies, well, they know everyone's on their mobile phone rather than their computers these days. Um, and again, I feel like that's one major thing that a lot of bug hunters miss is they'll find a bug or potentially a bug, but they'll never actually then simply visit the mobile version of the website or the actual get the mobile app because... I will explain it a bit later, but most mobile apps are like seriously vulnerable because I feel like a lot of developers don't realize that we can actually see what's happening behind the scenes. They assume, oh, well, no one can actually hack this phone. But yeah, I'll get into that. Um, so I'm looking in every single JavaScript file. And this is why I always say to people, I will spend months and months on the same program because when you are... When you've got like 50, 60 old endpoints, it can take a long time to go through all of these and understand what is working, how is it working, what's actually still live. Um, so again, this can take me weeks and months and yeah, I'm still attacking a lot of websites still. Um, and from finding the first bug, I'm simply searching these JavaScript files for as many references to booking references as I possibly can. Um, and this is where I always tell people a custom word list comes in handy. Because you can go on set lists and download a word list, which is fair enough. But a lot of websites will change parameter names to be like a shorter version of something. Um, so say, for example, address ID might be AID. So the A is short for address. Um, so as you're looking through the website, you should always be taking notes as to what parameter names are and be creating different variations of them, things like that. Because then when you do find API endpoints, simply trying these parameters you found elsewhere might actually work on this endpoint. Chances are they will. Um, and yeah, pretty simple. Again, I only hack with Burp. Everyone's familiar with Burp Suite, I presume. Well, those who do hacking. Um, so Burp Suite is a proxy tool from Portswigger. You can get the free edition, and I use the free edition for a year when hacking in bounties because I don't use any extensions really. Um, and the only good thing I find about the professional is the collaborator and the intruder. There's no limits to it. 
Um, and the main thing I always tell people with hacking is to just have fun, um, especially if you're doing bug bounties. Don't chase the money. Don't think, oh, I'm going to go just find an RCE and try to get a 10K payout. You, in my opinion, to be a successful hacker, you have to actually enjoy hacking as such. It's the puzzle. It's the challenge. You actually want to try and break it as such rather than just thinking cha-ching, um, which, again, I feel like a lot of people do. do. <laughs> so... It ended with seven critical bugs, again, and any single one of you in this room can load up an airline website and replicate exactly what I've done. I've just booked a flight, logged the requests, and any time I saw my booking reference, I changed it to someone else's. It's not hard, anyone can do it. Um, and so yeah, I will, that's what it was. So I could literally, they're all idle bugs, but from a main web application that is live, that people are still using to this day, is shocking in my opinion. Um, and that's something that I do really wanna try and do in this year, um, is teach developers and companies how to hack themselves, because a lot of com uh, companies have been sold the idea, well, open a bug bounty program, and you'll be told about all these bugs, and then you can work out what to do and go fix it. But what ends, up what ends up happening is people like me who do it full time, we're like, okay, we'll go hack you. We end up finding 30, 40 bugs in a week. And then the company's like, whoa, okay, what do we do now? Like, um, we've got a big problem here. And then they start having to ask, well, we're actually decommissioning that next week. So should we actually fix it? And yeah, it becomes, in my opinion, part of the language, a fuck fest, basically. And I've been at some of these companies where they're just like, we don't know what to do. Um, so that's what I really want to teach companies and especially um, QA teams, dev teams, security teams, and I really encourage companies to internally run their own hackathons, hacking your own code, because there's so much benefit from teaching your developers how to hack themselves, because then when they're creating code and features, if they can have in the back of their mindset, oh, two weeks ago, we was hacking on a website, and, so, and there was a bug so-and-so, maybe I should just verify it and what have you. And the same with QA teams. I don't understand how websites that hold people's passport information can go live when somebody at this company hasn't sat there for, should we try anyone's booking reference and see if it works? Um, yeah, they left it to me. Um, and then on the same program, so after some recon, so again, once I've actually cleaned up a main web application, there's not a lot left for me to actually focus on. Um, now, my recon includes pretty much the basic subdomain scanning, so you find subdomains exposed to the internet, um, and I mainly do a lot of Google dorking and GitHub dorking, um, because if you're searching, for, especially because now I have so much knowledge on this website from hacking on it for two, three weeks, I know parameter names used, I know endpoints used, I know everything, basically. Then when I'm asking Google questions, like, hey... What do you know about this company? Because here's the little bits I know about it. Can you piece, this, piece other bits together? And that's when you start dorking for like site, whatever, example.com, in URL, and you're looking for certain endpoints, parameters. And that's then also where I go to Wayback Machine. Um, this is something that I feel a lot of researchers do do, but you'll, it, Wayback Machine is an absolute goldmine for old bugs, basically. So back when Google was first upcoming, it was popular to have a robots.txt file. Everyone was, you need a robots.txt file, you need to tell Google what not to index, etc. Um, and then as time's gone on, people have been like, eh, we'll get rid of robots, we'll change a few things, remove some files and what have you. Whereas if you go on Wayback Machine and you type in any website, so let's say, for example, tripadvisor.com forward slash robots.txt, when I did run it on TripAdvisor, in their current robots file, they've only got like 100 endpoints, but when um, scraping seven years worth of data, it ended at 7,000 endpoints. Then from that, I because I've got all these parameter names, I can now mass test for as many bugs as I want. And yeah, that's how you overload teams who basically aren't ready. Um, it only ended with three other bugs where there was a GitHub repo. Again, GitHub is public. You, anyone can go on it and search for anything you possibly want. And there are still to this day so many API tokens, passwords, internal, everything. You can find everything on GitHub. Um, I mean, there's a very popular food chain and they're currently still leaking an API token to download the source code to all of their apps. Um, what you'd find from downloading the source code, who knows? Um, sadly, there was a plain text password leak as well. People, sadly, are still doing that. And then just an out-of-scope bug, uh, out bug, which was basically, I, there was an eyedor bug in the same 
um, area, but I could query employee data. So again, applying the same concept of an IDOR bug for querying anyone's data, well, can I get employee data? And now suddenly I'm not only affecting their user data, but I'm getting employees. Um, so I'm pretty understanding and pretty scared of using airlines now. <laughs> Um, so this is the one where I feel like people might get a bit scared because people are students and a lot of people are applying for jobs. Now, I didn't realise this when I got invited to this programme that a lot of websites out there use the same company for hosting their careers page. Um, <laughs> and a lot of websites are vulnerable to this. Um, so it was very simple. You could sign up for an account you could upload your CV, tell them your skills, and look for available jobs. Pretty straightforward, right? Everyone's done it. So the first thing that springs to my mind is, well, obviously I could upload my own CV, so I got a shell. Um, that was the first indication, like, this is going to be quite bad. But the main thing is, and my focus is, can I leak other users' data? And how is data actually stored when I'm applying for a job? So when you're actually telling them, hey, this is my name, this is what, when somebody reviews this later on, what are they actually going to see, basically? So maybe I'll be able to inject some blind XSS payloads or something like that. Um, so round two of hacking. Anyone have any guesses what's probably going to be vulnerable? Like Anyone think what might happen? No one? <laughs> okay. It's pretty simple, again. So... There was a feature to export my profile. So once you, you've signed up for an account, you've uploaded your CV, for some reason they'll let you export this. Um, I'm presuming, I don't know why, if I'm honest, why you'd want to export it all, but it, I don't know. Now, anyone have any idea what this request might be vulnerable to? So it's a simple post request, and it was to export candidates, travellers, and there was a JSON request and it had candidates. And there's a number there, 247830. Now that's my candidate ID. So when I send the request, it gives me a CSV format of all of my data. Now if I simply change that to any other number, I've got that person's details. So if I change it to candidate ID number one, I've got the first ever person who signed up. And like I say, I was ID number 247. So there's 247,000 other people applying for jobs on here and I can query all of your data. Literally, I've done nothing apart from sign up for an account and click a few buttons, and it's right there. So I'm thinking, hmm, looks pretty interesting. Now, yeah, I've just explained it before I added it on here. But yeah, like I say, so simply changing candidate ID to another ID. And the key thing is whenever you see numbers like this and they're referenced by candidate ID, address ID, something that is tagged to the ID, always try for an IDOR vulnerability. Um, and I'll get to some tips as to how to do that in a little bit. Um, and sadly, I have to tell them that, I mean, you've got a site-wide problem of um, indirect... People know what IDOR bugs is. I'm I've gone into this, presume everyone knows what an IDOR bug is. So an IDOR is um, indirect object reference. So your ID number one, you shouldn't be able to query the private details of ID number two. It should give you an error. But if you can, then you've got a bug, basically. <laughs> Something as simple as changing a number. Um, I found five bugs from 10 minutes of looking. And bearing in mind, right, top 500 company, fortune companies in the world use this company for their careers page. So some of your information might be on there. Um, not only that, but I could, there was bugs to change people's passwords, reveal passwords. I could delete your CV. I could change your CV, change skills. And this is, again, there's no master hacking done here, in my opinion. I've not got my hood up. I've got the black screen. I've got the green writing and the mass typing. I've literally just been clicking around, tried to export my profile and seen an interesting um, ID and changed it. It literally is not hard in my opinion so everyone pretty understanding of that um, so I've been hacking for now well I've been doing bug bounties for about five six years now um, I've been hacking well I mean I'm self like I say, I'm self taught I don't have any qualifications nothing like that I just taught myself how to hack sort of thing um, and everyone always says XSS is an internet problem. I believe IDORs are a very, very big problem. The fact that I can get invited to a brand new um, bug bounty program and it's a familiar name and you can find all of these bugs in minutes and it's like, how? <laughs> 
So from doing bug bounties for about, yeah, like I say, five or six years, um, and considering what I'm going to show you in a minute, just think about how many companies out there don't welcome people like me to poke at their systems, especially banks. They absolutely hate us. Um, there's probably an idle bug on there to send money from someone's account, in my opinion, because they're everywhere. Um, so they're all the, these are the interesting bugs I've found over the years, and this is why I call, called it saving user data, because I've been able to query millions and millions of user data. And I mean, that's including Facebook information, like access tokens if you've allowed an app and things like that, um, plain text passwords, address, full name, emails, the absolute lot. And this is, again, for only companies who are allowing me to basically pack on them. Um, and I, I strongly believe every single person in this room can find the exact same bugs I have. It's literally as simple as you see your ID, your request, change it to someone else's, check the response. Nine times out of ten, you're going to have a hit and you're going to be successful, in my opinion. Um, so has anyone got any questions about anything I have spoken about so far? Everyone pretty understand how to use a website, click on a few things, change some values. It's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> um, and I mean, like I say, these are all P1s. I mean, they're paying out minimum 10 grand. I'm earning people's salary in a week. Like, this is like their yearly salary in a week from simply changing some numbers. And this is why I believe, yes, bug bounty programs are very efficient for companies, but you need to have like those layers of defense first and the bug bounty program should come last because then if you do have a bug bounty program and you get a bug report for an IDOR or an XSS, instead of, okay, we'll fix it, here's $500, oh, I've got another one, $500, it should be, why was we vulnerable to this in the first place? What's gone wrong here? How can we prevent this from happening again? And that then a bug bounty program complements your security because then... Um, security researchers like me are simply not just changing numbers and being like, oh, another one, another one. I mean, look, look at how I'm listing these. I'm just putting another, uh, there was a bug somewhere. I was like, there's another one, there's another one. Um, and instead then, like I say, a bug money program can complement their security already because they can be like, okay, well, what's actually gone wrong here? And they're challenging people like me and then you're going to get more high quality reports rather than just XSS, XSS, XSS over and over again. Um, so for those of you who are learning to hack and want to go find all these bugs, um, these are my tips for looking for idols, basically. Um, I do have, like I say, my methodology and my platform coming out. Um, I should probably explain a little bit about that, I guess. So for those of you who weren't familiar with what bugbountynotes.com was, um, it was kind of for the community, by the community. So bugs that I'm finding on actual bug bounty programs, I would then code it up into a real website and like replicate it and then basically say, look, what can you find here? To teach people the mindset as to what they're looking for and what to try for. Um, and then I'd post a solution. Um, so the idea behind the new platform is, um, and I've not told anyone this, so it's just... <laughs> Yeah, new to people. So Bug Bounty Notes was, there's an XSS here. Can you find it? Can you bypass the filter? Um, but instead now, I've spent the last two months or so, I've literally created an entire website, which is probably as big as Amazon, with so many features and it fully works, sign up for an account. And along with my methodology and my training videos and content, I'm hoping people can basically read this and then go practice instantly on an actual real functioning website with real replicated bugs to get their mindset as to, I get it sort of thing. And then you go apply on bug bounty programs and hopefully you'll do well. <laughs> so the first tip is a JSON request. Everyone familiar with what JSON requests are? Um, so you've got the example being defined by example. So simply just try inject your own parameter and see what gets processed. So you can see that I've put in red ID equals one. So imagine there's a request, I'll use TripAdvisor as an example again, there was a request to add someone as admin to your hotel. Um, and there was no ID sent in the request at all. However, if you simply added ID and then another hotel ID, it added you to that hotel and you were now admin of another hotel. So that's in my opinion, I usually have the highest success rate. I mean, you can try injecting parameters on every request, but I typically have the most success with JSON requests. I'm not quite sure why, if I'm honest. I'm guessing how things are passed server-side. I don't know. Um, 
So yeah, simply try. And again, this is where your word list comes in handy because once you've been looking at a main web application and you've got all these notes written down and parameter names, you can simply run it for Intruder and try 10 different um, variations of an ID number and see, see what happens, basically. Uh, mobile apps, I like to say, I usually have a 99% success rate with a mobile app because you'll open your mobile app. I mean, let me think of an example. I mean, I will use Amazon as an example. They're not actually vulnerable to this, um, but I use Amazon. So imagine you open Amazon up and you're logged in and you visit your profile on Amazon and it loads up your information. Now, when you've got Burp Suite attached to your phone, you're logging the requests and that, usually the request is just api.example forward slash user and your ID. And then it's usually a JSON reply with all of your, all of your information. Simply changing that ID to someone else's you've got all of their information again. And I, I like to think that it's because developers don't re realize that we can see the request. I'm not quite sure why, why mobile apps are so vulnerable to it, but yeah, I usually have a very high success rate of mobile apps. Um, and to test mobile apps, the real simple way, quickly five minute, is if you've got Burp Suite installed on your computer, and you've got your phone, um, simply change the Wi-Fi settings to point to your local IP on the computer where Burp's running, um, and then visit HTTP Burp and install the certificate. And if they've got SSL pinning, then you're gonna need some way, there's lots of tutorials out there, and there's not enough time to <laughs> give all the tutorials on that, but there are ways to get rid of SSL pinning and things like that. And then simply, simply, when you are clicking things on your phone, you'll see the requests on your computer, and you can have a little play. Um, and honestly, Try it with some of the apps you've got on your phone and you, I mean, I'm not even saying change the numbers, but generally just uh, connect Burp and have a look at a lot of these apps and you will see these numbers. Um, obviously, if you don't have permission, don't be changing numbers, don't go to jail, but if you've got permission, yeah. But there's no harm in just having a look and saying, oh, there's the number Sean's on about and yeah. Um, so looking for features that use save data. So it's pretty self-explanatory, um, but coming from a developer, think about how, so an example is when you sign up for a website and you put your payment details in, usually they want your billing address as well, don't they? Now, if you've got an account on a website where you've already got your address, chances are they might say, hey, are any of your current addresses you've already got in your address book, your billing address? And usually then when you click on the address or you click on whatever type of item it is, they'll, it will be defined by just an ID. Um, and again, it's as simple as changing that ID. Um, and I know a lot of you are probably thinking, well, what about if the ID is encrypted and things like that? Um, there's lots of ways around this. So first of all, what IDs are available on public pages? Um, so another example on TripAdvisor, I mean, it is fixed. Um, did I find TripAdvisor? Well, for some company, is there was a vulnerability where I could delete anyone's photo, basically. Um, however, it was defined by a GUID, like G-U-I-D. Do you know what that is? Um, and I thought to myself, well, you can't actually generate these. You can't enumerate these. This isn't guessable. It's vulnerable to IDOR, but how am I actually going to get this value? Um, and this is where, again, using the main web application comes in handy in your notes because I found out that when you uploaded a photo and then you viewed the HTML source of your profile, the value was saved with um, the file path. So it was whatever CDN and a few random characters and then it'd have the value and then whatever your photo was called. And yeah, so I was a bit like, huh, okay. So let me go to someone else's profile, like one of my other test accounts. And I was like, okay, there's the value. Let's try delete it. And yeah, the profile photo was deleted. So even if you do see encrypted values and things like that, look for places that it's going to be leaked. And that's again, where you start looking in JavaScript files, start looking for references and things like that. Um, security through obscurity. Do people know what that's, that is? Um, so for those of you who don't, basically, Imagine you've got a number, one, two, three, and they base 64 encoded the value. So when the request was sent, you saw just letters and numbers and things, and so maybe someone who's new, they might think, don't know what that is, I'll, I'll miss that. Whereas if they just base 64 decoded it, it would tell them one, two, three. So I've had a lot of companies who will have a bunch of gobbledygook, basically. And I'm just like, like this, random characters, random numbers, and there's no special pattern. It's just completely random. And I'm thinking to myself, huh, 
this is odd. Um, and one thing, whenever you see that, is think to yourself, okay, so the company's gone to this much effort, but did they actually protect against idle? So you sign up for another account, grab your encrypted value, and try it on account number one just to test for idle. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but if it does work, then you know, okay, this is actually vulnerable to idle. Um, and if you can't find anywhere to leak it, what about if you just simply try a number? So instead of wanting to get this encrypted value, so imagine it said address, address ID equals, and there was a bunch of gobbledygook, imagine if you just simply tried address ID equals one. You ignored all of the encryption and all the obscurity, and you just simply tried a number. Chances are it might work. Um, I actually found 15 of these vulnerabilities on a company that shouldn't have had these vulnerabilities on because every single value they were just encrypted, but they was all vulnerable to IDOR because they obviously thought to themselves, oh, through, potentially they knew they had a site-wide problem and they thought they'd monkey patch it by encrypting these values to put off people maybe. Um, but yeah, if you ever see these encrypted values, you cannot go wrong by just simply trying a number. It just works sometimes. Um, so one parameter vulnerable to idle usually means there'll be more to find. So like I say, when I was hacking on this passenger um, airline website, I found one idle. Um, a lot of bug hunters will go from bug to bug. So they'll be looking for XSS, and then they'll suddenly try and open redirect, and then they'll suddenly try this. Um, and I find with that, it can actually burn you out a lot because... I don't know, your mind's just all over the place. So I like to, obviously, when I'm clicking through these features, obviously you're logging everything that happens, but I am primarily go in with the intention of wanting to find one set of vulnerability class to begin with, because I, you know, I mean, I want to get a sense as to this secu um, company's security. So if I was to hack Arbitrary Hackers, for example, I, my first thought is, well, do they have student accounts? And if they do, that means student data. So, and if that do have student accounts, chances are they'll have some sort of employee account, staff account, admin account. Um, so I'm not going to be bothered about XSS and trying to get someone's details via that. I'm going to start looking at, okay, well, if I reset my password, is there an ID in the request to define what user's password to reset? If I'm actually changing my account information, um, I mean, I could, I'm going a little bit off board here, but it goes back to... Um, the JSON request, so in, as well as just trying for idols, um, there was a blog post released where if you simply see something that says false, change it to true. Um, because say for example, it says admin false when you're updating your um, student information. If you simply change that to like admin true, it might actually be processed. Um, and there was a really good blog post, I believe I retweeted a couple of weeks ago, uh, where you can automate it in burp and any time it sees false it will replace it to true you might break the website but a lot of people have found bugs where they're testing new website like layouts before they've even come live um, they're, e they're able to change their account privileges and yeah um, yeah off topic a little bit <laughs> so yeah like I say one idle mistake usually leads to many many more um, and yeah I'm basically getting towards the end and I like answering questions and helping people learn to hack. So I guess we've got like 15 minutes and I won't hack your ex or anything like that. But does anyone have any questions or anything? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for bug bounty, when I first started hacking, um, there wasn't really anywhere to practice on, in my opinion. So it was like, I was kind of just practicing on any website such. That doesn't sound good. But it's not like I was hacking maliciously as such. I was just poking around a little bit. Um, that's where then I reached out to the companies and got permission and things like that. Um, but in this day and age, ideally, you can practice on VDPs, um, bug money programs. You've got Hack the Box, um, Port Swiggers Pen Test Lab Web um, Web Lab, Web Sec Academy. Um, yeah, all the great resources online. That's where I recommend people learn really, and my platform as well when it comes out. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. She asked me um, if where did I learn to hack basically um, when I was first starting out because I was self taught, um, and yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> With some of these companies, the bug bounty programs, folks are getting. Register, I guess. Have you seen over the past few years they've improved their internal software development program to do some 
bed hardening or security skewing of developers? Um, so the question was, um, over the time of me reporting bugs, have companies improved their security, basically? It depends on the company. Um, some companies just chuck money at the problem, and they incentivize researchers like me by saying, well, hey, look, we're going to pay you 10 times more money. Go find more bugs. Um, I'm, I, I guess it really does depend, because I've had some companies where they've, I mean, I'm Again, from reading JavaScript files, you can find features that are actually coming out before they've come out because they're referenced in the JavaScript file, but there's nothing on the website about it. Um, and I actually found a bug like that. Where it's, I mean, I've been hacking this company for about a year now, and I was finding loads of idols and XSS and things like that, and they documented this new code for certain people. I was almost about to say it, and they company then. <laughs> um, and it was basically vulnerable to idols. So it depends on the company, really. But I... At the moment, I'd say it's quite slim, in my opinion. That's why I want to really get into these companies. And I've reached out to a few British companies, and I am slowly making my way into helping them. But I really want to teach developers, security teams, and companies how to hack themselves, rather than relying on outsourced people, basically. That should come last, in my opinion. They should be really testing your stuff, not making 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 a joke out of it, basically. Because that's, in my opinion, that's what a lot of researchers do. They're laughing behind a lot of company scenes, like, well, this is our personal ATM machine here. And that shouldn't be what it should be, really. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> anyone? Uh, yeah. So you have a question about uh, both parties in the regular pen testing that yeah. these companies also have. Uh, so you've mentioned, uh, so I'm a pen tester. Okay. Uh, I do have my opinions about bug bounties. <laughs> uh, one good advantage about bug bounties is something you brush on, which is the amount of time that you have to test something. Yeah. Uh, and that's how you can be very limited in terms of time that okay. you have. Um, so the techniques are essentially the same. Yeah. Uh, we just try to cram as much as we can within sort of like the three days that we have yeah. or four days that we have. Um, is it do you think bug bounties are the uh, sort of the solution, or like I say, I believe they should come last because instead of you waking up and being like, oh, "We've had a P one and everyone panicking and fixing it," it should be like, "How did this happen?" Like. You should be able to, like I say, I believe companies should run potentially internal hackathons where you're teaching developers and security teams and QA teams how to hack themselves, change certain values and put certain things like XSS, try this, try that. Because once they can get the core basic down, then when you do later on open a bug bounty program, like I say, when you receive a report, it's not just going to be, here's 500 for XSS, fixed. Oh, we've got another one coming in from someone else. We'll give him 500 fixed. It should be, how did this XSS slip through our filters and whatever else you've got in place, really? Um, I didn't repeat the question again, did I? It was... Uh, <laughs> what was it again? Like, <laughs> is it, is it, uh, what I was going to say, sort of the final question yeah. is, do you think bug bounties are sustainable for security researchers in the sense okay. that... Obviously, you can survive on them now. Is it something that is sustainable for the future? Okay, so he asked, does he think bug bounties is sustainable? Um, that's a good question. Um, in my opinion, probably not, because like I say, I'm hoping companies are going to get, at the end of the day, pissed off at how many reports are still coming in. Um, the only problem is with bug bounties is you've got, I won't, I won't name platforms and companies and what have you, but you've got platforms and companies like, you need a bug bounty program. We're paying out so much, this is so good. And some companies who aren't too clued up in security are getting sucked into that without realizing. Um, so I, sustainable in a way, but probably they probably won't earn you as much money as they have been doing over the last few years, really. Um, and I mean, I mean, a lot of people sold the idea that bug bounties are going to make you millionaires, but the problem that a certain platform doesn't tell everyone is all of those seven millionaires have become millionaires from live events, pretty much, because you report a bug to one of these companies who isn't running a live event, you're going to get like five grand. You hold it for one of these events, you're going to get 25 grand. So, of course, these people stockpile as many bugs as possible, and that's why people like Doggy G will walk away with 180 grand in one day, whereas I'll do the same work and report it to their normal program and just get 10K. And I'm like, 
Um, so sort of sustainable, sort of not. It, again, it depends on the company. Again, there's so many companies who are opening programs that shouldn't be opening programs. One of the things that I'm thinking about is, so imagine they pay $500 or pounds or whatever yeah. for, for a bug. If you think about it, maybe companies will rely on bug bounty pro, programs instead of regular pen testing because it's cheaper for them. Yeah. Because you just say, okay, in your own time, within the next three months, sort of, you have three months to look at the platform. Yeah. Whereas if you're buying, if you're paying a company to do a pen test on your, yeah. on your product, you have to pay, I don't know. Yeah, it is. A, it is definitely a lot cheaper. But again, you've also got to keep researchers interested. I mean, if if I have a bad experience with one program, that's it. You're gone. And then what? Do you know what I mean? What's happening? They're not actually getting anything. And that's then when you see bug bounty programs who were paying a thousand dollars are now suddenly paying five thousand dollars because they want to re incentivize you to get back in. Really. Um, so yeah, cool. Uh, any uh, yeah. What's the best way to like? So if you've checked, so if they've got a security.txt file, um, Ed Overflow um, is trying to get a new standard that if companies want to receive reports as such, they'll have a security.txt file on their um, website the same way as a robots.txt. Um, I don't recommend tweeting out to them or any, or I don't really recommend reaching out to their customer service team either because most people, customer service companies are like, You've hacked us? Like, what? Should we be calling the police or something? Um, try and find their Cisco on Twitter um, or LinkedIn and things like that. Usually you'll find some sort of personal email. And usually what I've done for bugs that I've found in the past where there's no like official way to report it is I'll just simply say, hey, here's who I am. I come in peace. I found a vulnerability. And just detail what you found. And do you know what I mean? Then they've got it and they can do whatever. Never ask for money or anything like that. If they want to offer it you after, then they might. But never... Say hey, pay me and I'll give you the bug. Really, um, yeah. Anyone? Um, so, say so you play material on a website that you think may be vulnerable, may not. Yeah. How far down the rabbit hole will you go? <laughs> how much time will you invest before deciding that may not be? Uh, so he asked me how much time will I spend on a website and go down the rabbit hole. Uh, I get asked that quite a lot, and in all, in all honesty, there's no time limit. Um, it's not like a football game where there's a certain period and then you've got to go have a break. I it just comes with experience, I guess. The longer you are hacking and the more bugs you've been finding, it just tweaks in your head. I know you just get that gut feeling. Um, sometimes I can spend hours and hours. Usually after four or five hours and I'm getting a headache, I'll probably write it down in my notes and come back to it later. Um, but in all honesty, don't put a time limit on hacking, really. Do you know what I mean? That's why I say have fun with hacking because there shouldn't be a time limit. You should just kind of, you just know. You've tried everything you can and, yeah, just move on, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's... You are sorry? No, then we don't get then I don't get paid then. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. So he was saying that there's no pressure on bug hunters, um, and that is true. There is no time pressure, but but there is also the pressure that you won't get paid if you don't put enough time in. I guess. Um, but yeah, you had a question. Who should people be looking at, basically? <laughs> so, yeah. no, so I think that probably the best company would be someone who is mm. vulnerable, but also is doing everything else correct. Um, there's quite a lot. I mean, most of them are private. That's the only problem. And I have no problem telling people about companies who welcome hackers because the more people looking and hacking, I guess the better. The only problem is, is I've been banned from a lot of platforms for running my mouth and telling people they're like, no, you must not tell them about this program. And it's like, but why? I know there's a really good hacker and he would like to be able to hack on here. But yeah. Um, I, there's not really a go-to program to hack. I mean, a lot of people recommend Verizon Media, but I submitted a bug to them and kind of left with a bit of a sour taste because they told me that Yahoo Cricket was in scope. Um, so I went and looked at Yahoo Cricket, found and found an SSRF. And again, that was as simple as opening Yahoo Cricket and there was a request made with a URL and you change it to AWS IP before they obviously fixed it all and you got their AWS creds and things. Um, but Verizon Media take a long time to kind of pay out and do stuff really um 
I don't know. It, I kind of go for the companies I know and I use every day. Um, do you know what I mean? That's how I got involved with Amazon. Um, so I was the first security researcher to be recognized by Amazon's re- retail team. Um, so a lot of you are using Amazon and you're actually secure, a lot more secure now, thanks to me. Um, yeah, trust me. <laughs> But the good thing with Amazon um, is they have a security at Amazon.com, um, and they also are on HackerOne. Hopefully, they're not going to ban me now for this, for telling people. But typically, if you impress them enough with a bug to their... I mean, they have an actual security at Amazon.com, and they welcome reports, and they'll keep you updated. Chances are, if you impress them with enough, they're going to invite you to their program. That's usually how it works. Um, yeah, they're not really... A, I don't know how to answer that, really. It's not a go-to thing, really. Um, okay. Cool. Any? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, what about the Apache programs versus crowdsource testing like uh, Cobalt? Uh, I don't. I've never really. I mean, I've heard of them, but I don't know too much about them, really. Um, it might work. It might not. I don't know. Do you know much about it? <laughs> no, I, I, I am. I am on Cobalt. I've okay. Some stuff for them. Uh, the advantage is. You do put it in like two weeks of work. Okay. You get paid. Oh, so you get paid for your time on there? Yeah. Okay. You get paid regardless, uh, independently whether you find good or Do you still get paid per bug as well or not? No, 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 no. no okay. You get paid for the two for Okay. 35 hours of work. That's not bad. But yeah. Uh, any more questions, anyone? I don't know. Really no, that's all right. That's cool. No worries. Um, yeah, well, thank you everyone for coming to the talk. And yeah, be sure to follow me on Twitter, Z Yeah. Cheers. <laughs>